Okay, as you wish. So, uh, hello again. Uh, I'm, this will be the last time you you put up with me this week. Uh, but we come to the fourth and final uh, uh, episode in this lecture course, the Goethe Demerung of it. Uh, so, I this lecture will be in two parts. One will be uh, addressing charm physics at the LHC, and I don't know how much charm physics has been covered in the other lectures, uh, but I think it is a particular strength of the Hadron machines. And in the second half of the lecture, I will uh, talk about future prospects for Hadron Collider flavor studies. Okay, so starting with charm. So charm, without doubt, has, has a glorious history. It played a, a key role in the foundations of the standard model. Uh, its existence was uh, invoked to explain the uh, suppression of K long to mu mu, for example, and also the rate of uh, uh, K0 mixing. That's the gym mechanism, and that is uh, central to the flavor structure of, stand of the standard model. And the discovery of the JSI in 1974 was uh, a very famous event, and that brought essentially immediate acceptance of the existence of quarks. But since then, uh, at least until recently, charm has largely fallen out of uh, favor. Uh, there's this very uh, provocative article by Icarus Biggie from uh, uh, 2008. Uh, I know she invented fire, but what has she done recently? So th there was a, quite a long period uh, of, of, of neglect of this uh, of the charm quark and charm studies. Uh, it's true that charm has certain disadvantages compared to strange and beauty. The, the neutral meson mixing effects, uh, which we'll discuss shortly, are expected to be very small. Uh, coupled with that, the CP violation effects are also expected to be very small. Uh, this is partly a consequence of the uh, uh, almost perfect effects of the gym mechanism in the charm system. Also, the theoretical predictions are somewhat imprecise because of hadronic effects. They are resistant to the techniques which have been developed for handling the light kaon system and the heavy beauty system. So due to these reasons and, and due to uh, 30 years of uh, experiment, which uh, led at least to a confirmation of points one and two, charm became the Cinderella of flavor studies, uh, laughed at by its uh, sisters, uh, the kaon and, and B physics studies. Uh, who somewhat uh, eclipsed it. But this neglect was always unjustified. Look, the points one and two can be seen positively as very small expectations in the standard model provides a, a low background above which larger new physics effects could manifest themselves. And in contrast to strange and beauty, charm is an uptight quark and that gives it unique access to uh, new physics effects which uh, the other systems would not probe. And indeed, early this century, Charm's fairy godmother moment did arrive. So uh, to lead up to that, uh, let me uh, remind you once more about Charm meson mixing. Uh, we spoke uh, at uh, some length about this uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, flavor oscillations or mixing, it can be mediated by either short range diagrams or longer range diagrams. And I draw those for the beauty and kaon system respectively. Uh, for it's known to be uh, slow for uh, K mesons, quicker for B0 mesons, and even quicker for BS mesons. Uh, in these diagrams, the box diagrams are, are particularly interesting because they're sensitive to potential new physics effects. Uh, uh, and also because that process provides several ways that CP violation could enter and manifest itself. It's a higher order diagram. We spoke about the attraction of these uh, in our discussion about flavor changing neutral currents this morning. So now pivoting back to charm, in charm, the, the, the parameters that describe the mixing oscillations are uh, given the rather uninspiring uh, uh, titles X and Y. So X is the mass splitting of the neutral, uh, um, of, of the mass states uh, normalized by their mean width, and Y is the width splitting. Uh, Okay, so one thing we know and, and, and have known for a long time and was predicted to be so, and it could not be otherwise, is that uh, uh, X and Y are certainly very small. But exactly how small that was not known. And, and uh, there was a very large range in predicted values. 
So this is a somewhat infamous plot uh, initially made by uh, Harry Nelson and updated here in 2003 by Alexei Petrov. Uh, so this is for either X or Y. Uh, it's just numbers along the top are, are, are just references which you can find in his paper. But these were the predicted values of X and Y at that time. And you see they're all small, but they're spanning a, a huge range and many of them are very, very small indeed. The people really had no idea uh, how big these effects could be, uh, but imagine they could be uh, almost uh, impossible to see. Now, in terms of predictions, the situation has improved since then, no doubt guided by the results which we're about to discuss, but the question still remains a, a challenging one. Uh, so how would we look for charm mixing? There's actually a, a, a variety of uh, signatures, but let's focus on, on this important one, so-called uh, wrong sign uh, k pi. So, so D can decay to uh, uh, a k and, and a pi on, uh, and uh, uh, there, there, uh, there's a, let me maybe discuss this slide first, yes. Uh, so what is, uh, but it can decay to a wrong sign uh, uh, k pi, and that means that the, uh, the, the k on would be uh, positive for a, uh, a d zero. And we, we call that wrong sign because if you forget about mixing, then you would, uh, this would be uh, mediated by the W Kibibo suppressed amplitude. So down in rate by about a factor of 300 on the, the right sign uh, d to k pi. Uh, but if you allow for the possibility of mixing, uh, you have a, a possibility that uh, you can have a, uh, either a direct decay to the wrong sign k pi, or you can have a, a, a mix and a decay, or you can have uh, interference between the two. And so that gives you this uh, time dependent decay rate shown here, uh, which involves the mixing parameters. Uh, and uh, these uh, appear at least for Y in at first order. Uh, so this, this is uh, certainly of, of, of interest. Uh, you, you note uh, rather than write X and Y, I've written X prime and Y prime. Uh, that is because that there is due to this uh, other direct amplitude uh, contributing to the decay, uh, what you end up being sensitive to is a uh, X and Y rotated by a strong phase. But this rotation in this case is actually uh, quite small. So that's somehow our, our benchmark uh, analysis. Uh, and it, people knew this was good analysis for uh, a way to look for charm mixing. And it was pursued for many years, but without uh, any uh, positive signal coming up. So we need to compare here the rate of something which was initially uh, D0 compared to D0 bar. This is what RT means, it's the ratio of the two. Okay, so we need to flavor tag. We discussed flavor tagging yesterday for B decays. What about for charm decays? Uh, actually for charm decays, the situation is easier. Uh, we need to know the D0 decay at birth and that there's a beautiful way we can do this. Uh, a lot of D0s come from a strong decay of D stars, which leads to a, a pion being produced, uh, often called a slow pion because it's almost at rest in the uh, E star rest frame. Uh, and the charge of that kion, of that pion, I beg your pardon, is directly correlated to the flavor of the D0 at birth. So this is a, a great way to uh, flavor tag Ds. And uh, this has been exploited a lot at the B factories and at the LHC. And at the LHC, this means you can uh, take uh, D stars, which are produced in the primary interaction, uh, and uh, look for the slow pion and exploit them in the measurement. There's also the possibility of taking Ds from uh, uh, B decays, and this also has been used uh, to LHCB. It's a very useful addition, maybe not as powerful as the first because their statistics are lower. But here you uh, uh, look for a B which uh, flies from the primary vertex, a B which decays semi electronically. You then have typically a, a muon uh, as well as the D0, which decays into uh, here, it's listed as decaying into KK. Uh, and uh, the, the, the charge of that muon is again uh, correlated to the uh, flavor of the D0. Okay, so that's how we make the measurement. Uh, the measurement was pursued for many years and, and, and nothing was seen. But then things started to change. And uh, we have to give great credit to the B factories here, to Barbara and Bell. Uh, these were commissioned to do B physics, but they started a thriving charm program. 
uh, and uh, various analyses, but let's focus on the wrong sign k pi, they started to show something up. So here on the left, you see a, uh, uh, the, the signal peak, this is the so-called delta M distribution. It's the mass difference between the D star and the D when the D star is decayed into the slow pine and the, the D. Uh, so very clear signal peak. Uh, and then one can uh, look at the evolution of that signal with time uh, normalized by the uh, right sign events. And here one sees a, a, a fit to it. Uh, but one then looks at the residuals. The fit here is a fit which does not allow for mixing. And you can see that, that uh, those residuals are lousy. Uh, so one sees that there's something going on here. And this is a strong indication of mixing. And indeed, with measurements from uh, uh, Bell and, and, and measurements in complementary channels, uh, uh, within a very short period of time, uh, we went from a situation on the left here. This is an exclusion plot from a charm conference in 2006, where Ian Sitzi, my boss, said all results are null. Um, put that on his gravestone. Uh, then a, a year later, uh, we actually have uh, at uh, five sigma, uh, the no mixing hypothesis excluded. So mixing had been discovered. But this through the combination of a uh, uh, the whole ensemble of measurements. But this was a great step forward. It suddenly rekindled uh, interest in the, uh, in the, in the community. Uh, but what we don't know uh, is, is when well, we didn't know then is that, uh, you know, was this being driven by X or Y? You see these plots have X on the X axis and Y on the vertical axis. And uh, the, the precision on both of them, particularly X is not particularly good. So, the LHC took notice, uh, and indeed they had the Fermilab also, which was still operating very much so at that time. Uh, and the potential at Hadron machines is enormous. Uh, for example, at the LHC, the charm cross-section is about 20 times that of duty production. And I rhapsodized in my first lecture on Friday about uh, uh, you know, how enormous the rate of duty production is. The charm, you're up by a factor of 20. All the considerations that I uh, uh, brought to your attention on, on Friday uh, about uh, how you need to do beauty physics, uh, that you need a suitable acceptance, uh, instrumentation, you very much need a trigger. These remain uh, equally true for charm. They apply here just as much. Uh, the only thing you can say is that uh, charm is just probably a, a little harder to trigger on as they are less massive particles, uh, slightly shorter lived, uh, and so the triggering efficiency will always be less, but essentially the trigger you build for beauty will also work for charm. And then to just put into perspective the uh, you know, great scale of uh, charm production at Hadron Colliders compared to E plus E minus machines, here are uh, three illustrative channels. The first one is uh, D to K pi. This is uh, the wrong sign K pi. It's in some sense the easiest mode for Hadron machines. Uh, the rightmost mode is D to K short pi pi. That's a little more tough because it's multi-body and it's got a K short in it. And in the middle, there's a decay of pi zero, which is uh, very tough. But in all cases, you can look at these analyses uh, performed by CDF and more recently by LHCB. And you see the event yields are much, much higher than uh, at the B factories. Uh, and for instance, even in this, this mode on the right, this mediumly difficult mode, uh, K short pi pi, uh, the most recent LHCB analysis had 30 times the statistics that of uh, Barbar or Bell. So Hadron machines are, are really the place to, to do this uh, sorts of measurements, I believe. And indeed, this was shown very uh, early on. Uh, so I've shown you that there was this uh, wrong sign mixing discovered from the ensemble of measurements at the uh, B factories. Uh, the Hadron machines, when, once they turned their attention to this, that they, they performed the wrong sign mixing measurement. So you see one on top from, uh, on the left, I beg your pardon, from LHCB, and one on the right from CDF. Uh, so one uh, sees now a very, if you look at the LHCB case, a very prominent uh, signal peak, 36,000 events. That's an order of magnitude larger than that of Barbar. And this was uh, just with one inverse femtobarn of data. Uh, less than a tenth of the data we now have. Uh, but with this signal, uh, you can uh, look at this uh, relation. Let me go back to it. Uh, and you see that this relation uh, 
uh, is uh, essentially uh, linear in y or y prime. Uh, essentially, we, we don't get oscillations here. That's because the parameters are very, very small. And the expansion leads to essentially uh, linear effects rather than oscillations. Uh, if you wait long enough, you'd see an oscillation, but most of the these have died by then. But you see a very uh, clear linear slope in this uh, wrong sign to right sign ratio against proper time. And this is lying nine sigma away from the no mixing hypothesis. So a very uh, vivid signal. Uh, okay, so now if we uh, 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 turn uh, you know, wind forward in time to uh, just uh, uh, a year and a half or so ago, uh, the, these measurements have improved in precision and there's other measurements which are added into the bundle. And now this uh, plot of X and Y uh, shows uh, uh, that, that the fits are favoring a region which are many, many, many sigma away from the no mixing hypothesis. I mean, that ship has sailed. We know mixing is taking place. But uh, in terms of the values of the parameters, one sees that Y is, you know, well, uh, reasonably well measured. This is on the uh, on, on the vertical axis, uh, but X this is still not known at all, really. So X is not uh, shown to be non-zero at the five sigma level. So this is where we were uh, in 2020. Uh, now uh, later that year. Uh, or actually uh, last year, even more recent than that, uh, a measurement was produced with this, uh, this K short pi pi final state. So this is with these 31 million decays. Now this is a very uh, 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 beautiful channel to make studies in. Uh, you have the three body final state and you can uh, construct this Dalitz plot. And this is the same sort of Dalitz plot we were looking at in the context of the gamma analysis, if you might remember. So it's been colored in uh, to illustrate different uh, bins. And these bins have been uh, chosen because the strong uh, phase uh, within those bins is known to be rather constant. Um, and the strong phase uh, uh, rotates the, the mixing parameters by a, a, a fixed amount. Uh, this is just the same as in the uh, K pi measurement. Uh, and, and what we can do here is uh, we can uh, compare the ratio of uh, uh, the as a function of proper time of events in, in, in uh, one bin compared to the symmetric bin, the other side of the Dalit uh, divider. So this is uh, analogous to the wrong sign K pi measurement, but we're doing it in several bins and each bin has its own strong phase. Uh, so the, the mixing parameters get rotated by different amounts. So you would hope to see uh, uh, different uh, uh, dependencies in each bin uh, and depending on the value of the strong phase, and these strong phases we know well from measurements performed at charm threshold, at S3, for example, you would hope to see different dependencies, some which may be um, more sensitive to X than, than uh, uh, is the case for the wrong sign K pi case. And indeed, uh, this is what was seen. Uh, so here you see plotted on the left, these, uh, this is, comes from these, there's in total eight pairs of bins. So these are the ratio uh, for the bin in the top half of the plot to the bottom half of the plot. Uh, and you see there are fits made against proper time and you indeed see slopes, slopes which are uh, 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 varying with proper time in a, you know, in a, in a well understood manner. Uh, and from these slopes, we are able to extract uh, both X and Y and uh, we actually measure X uh, uh, very well. We find that uh, it has a non-zero value with a significance of about uh, seven sigma. And just to show what an improvement this brought to our knowledge of charm physics, uh, if you uh, look in this plot again, it's X against Y. Blue was the situation before this measurement, taking all measurements ever made previously. And in uh, brown, you see uh, what this measurement did. So a huge step forward in precision, uh, very uh, remarkable. Uh, now, uh, so mixing has, is definitely there. It's been seen, it's been well measured. Uh, uh, should we pack up and go home? Not at all. Uh, I mean, this is just one staging post on the way to a still more interesting uh, observation, which is that of CP violation, CP violation in mixing related phenomena. So these are the sorts of things we discussed uh, in the beauty system, for instance, JSIK short, and have been seen in the neutral K-on system. We're talking about indirect CP violation 
CP violation uh, related to the interference between the mixing and the decay or, or, or in the mixing itself. So to look for this, we just take the, we just reperform our measurements, but separately for D and D bar. So you see a, 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 a recent LHCB a wrong sign K pi measurement. So we uh, uh, divide our wrong sign signal. Now it has almost a, a, a million events by the right sign signal. Uh, and we get these uh, slopes, these mixing slopes, which you see in the top two plots. And these are now uh, incredibly precise, but these are made separately for D0 and D0 bar. So you look to see if there's any difference between them. And clearly here, there's no difference. So this tells us that CP violation uh, has not been seen. So if it's there, it must be very small. Uh, and it's quantified by, by two parameters, Q over P. Uh, the, this is the sort of conventional uh, flavor physics parameters. These are the coefficients that relate the mass eigenstates to the flavor eigenstates. If there's no CP violation in the mixing, uh, the magnitude of Q over P should be equal to one. Uh, and then you have this uh, possible phase difference between the mixing and the decay amplitudes, which here is labeled phi D. Um, so this, uh, in constraining these parameters, or all, all uh, measurements are important, but uh, again, this uh, K short pi pi study has particular weight. You see in the phi against Q over P minus one plane, where the no standard, uh, where zero CP violation would be at zero, zero, you see uh, this uh, dramatic increase in precision uh, that this uh, latest measurement brought. And indeed, if we take all of the data and, 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 and combine them, this is where we are at. Uh, so again, uh, here in this plane, no CP violation would be at zero, zero. Uh, but one sees that, uh, that okay, uh, the, the data are compatible with that, but, but, but they're straining to be compatible with that. There's a, a two sigma tension here. Uh, so uh, this is something very interesting to keep our eye on. Uh, it should be said that uh, you know if if this uh, central value were to remain where it is, uh, and we would see CP violation in mixing uh, in the near future, uh, a theorist would be very very surprised indeed. They, they think it's uh, much smaller than this. But what do they know? So this is the search for CP violation in, in mixing related phenomena. But there, there's another category of CP violation, and here. This is one on, in which LHCB has already delivered. So uh, that is a direct CP violation or, or CP violation in decay. So uh, as ever to try and see CP violation, we're looking for the, uh, a, a weak phase, uh, which switches sign between D0 and D0 bar, but to expose the phase, we need to have uh, two interfering diagrams, uh, one with this phase and one with some CP uh, conserving phase. So, so the, way to get these diagrams in charm is to go to singly suppressed decays like d to kk or d to pi pi and you see these uh, two diagrams there uh, and one of them is tree level and the other involves penguins and the uh, penguins and these uh, loop level processes we've said many times these are of uh, great interest as they in those new physics might lurk so what we do we, we uh, look at these uh, uh, to be both suppressed decays and we form a cpa symmetry we compare the rate of D to D bar going into KK. Uh, this is sorry to say symmetry should have a obviously a, a positive sign in the denominator. Uh, on LHCB, we did this uh, for both for, 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 for pi on tag D zeros, so with the slow pi and from prompt D zeros, and also the mu on tag D zeros. The, 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 mu, the meson here is, is, is neutral, uh, uh, so that there's mixing going on, but what we're actually trying to probe for here is the so-called direct CP violation. So we measure this asymmetry integrated over all times. Uh, uh, what, what I'm going to show you is essentially a probe of CP violation in the decay. It is not time dependent. So uh, we just measure this asymmetry. You might think, well, if you see a non-zero asymmetry, then, then uh, you, you're done. That, that must mean that uh, we've seen CP violation. But uh, life is not so easy. We're probing for effects which are at the sub percent level. Uh, and and uh, so that is the, the first uh, term on this right hand side. But there's other things which can uh, come into your measurement and, and affect your raw asymmetry. For instance, you could have a, uh, a detection asymmetry for the final state. 
uh, this actually is not relevant in this case because we're looking for uh, kk or pi pi and it is a you know it's a symmetric decaying to pseudo scalars so, so so that term we can get rid of but then you have to worry about for instance the particle which is tagging the decay the, the slow pi on and it's the same for the muon uh, you know if you detect a, a pi plus differently from pi minus um, and you can certainly do that at the percent level and this would give a bias Furthermore, there's the possibility of a production asymmetry that uh, there can be different numbers of D star pluses and D star minuses produced uh, certainly within your acceptance. And that would also uh, contribute to this asymmetry. So you'd like to get rid of these uh, things so you can just uh, focus on uh, the first term on the right hand side the thing we are after. Okay, uh, well, the but there's a way to do this, and that's because if you have two final states, kk and pi pi, uh, the, the CP violation is certainly not expected to be the same for these two states. Indeed, uh, there are naive expectations that should actually be uh, equal and opposite. But the, the nuisance terms, these detection asymmetries and production asymmetries, uh, they, they will be the same. They won't depend on the final state, uh, provided you're looking in the same phase space region. So what we do is we, we, we construct this uh, observable delta ACP, which is the difference between the raw asymmetries in KK and pi pi. Uh, and in that, these uh, nuisance uh, contributions will cancel out and you're left with what you're looking for. But you have to do this within the right uh, kinematic region. So uh, due to how things are selected, uh, we tend to select KKs and pi pi's in slightly different regions of the detector with slightly different kinematics. So it's important to actually uh, reweight those kinematics. So we are dealing with, uh, you know, we are really comparing like with like. And here's an example of the reweighting. Okay, uh, so now we come to the, the results of this analysis. So it's traditional here to show you some plots. This analysis has one of the most exciting results of uh, recent uh, LHC physics in my view, but the plots are as boring as they come because there's nothing really to show you apart from mass peaks. And these mass peaks are, are beautifully clean and they are enormous. So for KK, you see you have 44 million signal decays uh, and uh, 14 million for pi pi. So they, 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 these are huge mass peaks, right? Um, but, uh, and here are the uh, equivalent for the, the semi-electronic decays. So here, uh, with the statistics are somewhat lower, but we're still uh, almost 10 million for the KK case. Anyway, so with these, we measure the raw asymmetries, we reweight, and we uh, calculate delta ACP. There are systematics, of course, we need to account for, but these are by construction at a very low level, just because of the uh, delta ACP method. Uh, and indeed, uh, these are assigned uh, essentially from data, and uh, as they are smaller than the statistical errors, and as, as we accumulate still more statistics, these contributions will go down. So here is the result. So, so Guy, sorry to stop you, but yes. just 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 to go back to that table. Yes. Um, so, so so the difference one sees between the pi and the mu tagged is purely the statistics of the samples in these systematics, or is uh, there is is there a genuine uh, it, is the muon sample more difficult in some way? Oh no, it's it's almost uh, completely uh, uh, statistics driven. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. So so here is our result. Uh, uh, so we can measure delta ACP uh, separately for uh, the the pion tagged and the mu tag samples. Uh, this analysis was done uh, for the run two data. There was already a run one data. Uh, analysis published, and you see that we're getting a negative number, uh, and but that number is uh, is compatible between the two samples, and that's great. And it's also compatible with the run one results. And if we uh, combine all this together, we get uh, this result here: minus fifteen plus or minus three ten to the minus four. So the precision of this measurement is three ten to the minus four. So this is a, a incredible exactitude. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of any more precise measurement uh, made at the LHC. And what is very uh, evident is that this is uh, not uh, consistent with zero. 
So CP violation, CP violation turns out to be in the decay, direct CP violation has been observed at uh, over five sigma. Okay, so that, uh, uh, that th this is certainly an important milestone in, in flavor physics. And you can see where this rests. Uh, you may ask, well, is that in agreement with the standard model? As I hinted at earlier, standard model calculations are difficult to make. Uh, if you'd asked most theorists a few years ago, they would have said, uh, no, I expect it to be smaller. Uh, but uh, I think maybe there is some uh, majority feeling that this is compatible with the standard model, but a few think it is uh, uh, larger than expected. Uh, so we want to, we, we need some progress. Uh, certainly we need experimental progress, we need uh, theoretical progress, but experimental progress, we want to make individual measurements of the CPA symmetries in KK and Pi Pi, not just the delta ACP. And we'd like to make measurements in other modes. Uh, so these are all planned and the search for CP violation in mixing related observables that I have commented on. So certainly Cinderella has come to the ball. Uh, charm physics is now firmly re-established as a leading discipline in flavor studies. The B physics played a critical role in initiating the revival, but it's, uh, I really think uh, LHEB is the Prince Charming has revolutionized the field. And it's, we've now really opened a, a new era in flavor studies uh, and it will be great to see how this uh, unfolds. But to do so, we need still higher precision. And this motivates the, the second part of my talk, uh, which is you know, how we will get this improved precision. We need this not just for charm physics, but uh, in a whole host of flavor observables. And I list some here, which are uh, you know, particularly focusing on the things which are very small or the things which are theoretically clean, where uh, uh, you know, more statistics would be particularly welcome. Uh, so uh, we can't just continue to operate LHCB uh, from run one and what run two forever. Uh, we need a step change in sensitivity and this requires radical changes. And this is the LHCB upgrade or upgrade one as it's uh, uh, better to call it. Uh, and uh, there, there are two key features to this upgrade. Okay, so the first is well, yeah, let me talk about the second first. Uh, the, the, so that is to raise the operational luminosity. At, uh, and we're going to raise it to 2 10 to the 33, which is five times that value we had in run two. Now you might say, why didn't you just do that with the existing detector? Well, uh, a variety of reasons, but the main reason is the trigger would not have worked. It would have saturated. We'd have lost efficiency. So the, what we are doing, and this is the most radical step, uh, and uh, represents a real paradigm shift in particle physics experiments. We're moving to a full software trigger where we're going to uh, get away with that uh, early level L0 hardware trigger and read out the whole detector at 40 megahertz. And we're going to read out the whole detector at 40 megahertz. That bears repetition. Uh, so this will give us, uh, then you'll have, much, you'll have access to much uh, better information. It will give you improved efficiency in hadronic modes and also then make it worthwhile and possible to go to these higher luminosities. Uh, but this uh, necessitates a redesign of several subdetectors. We also have higher occupancy, so we need to account for that and, and we need to overhaul the readout everywhere. So this is the detector which operated until a few years ago. It's now been replaced um, essentially up. Uh, all of the subdetectors have been uh, replaced, well, for the, the calorimetry and the muon system, it's just the electronics. But for the Velo, uh, that's got, we're going to a, a silicon pixel detector there. Uh, the rich, we have new photo detectors. The tracking system is being replaced by a very large scintillator fiber tracker. And uh, the key point, let me emphasize it again, we are moving to a full software trigger. So all readout boards have been replaced and all the data has been replaced so we can uh, uh, get the data off this detector at uh, 40 megahertz. Uh, and here is how the upgrade one detector then would look. Uh, and this is not a pipe dream. This is something which is happening now. Uh, so you see uh, uh, here some Avalo modules. On the bottom right, you see the planes of the uh, silicon fiber tracker being lowered into the pit uh, next to Geneva Airport. On the right, you see the uh, half of Rich 2 photo detector plane 
uh, almost everything was there. And, and since we've been uh, talking in this uh, uh, in, in this uh, lecture in this school, uh, still more things have arrived. While we were speaking on Friday, this uh, lorry, this truck arrived uh, in Geneva after the LHCB pit all the way from uh, Liverpool. You can see that if you look closely enough, the, the truck has no hubcaps. And this was containing the uh, half of the velo detector. The first half was there already. This is the second half that is now at the experiment. It's being installed and it will shortly be commissioned. Now everything is there apart from a, uh, the sort of upstream tracker, which is called the UT, and that will be installed later this year. So upgrade one is now. So to put this in a timeline, uh, this is uh, uh, up to, we're, we're here in uh, 2022. Uh, we've collected this nine inverse femtobarns with uh, upgrade one. Uh, when we go to upgrade two, uh, this will operate through uh, runs three and four, which is essentially uh, uh, the coming decade and just the start of the next decade. So we have this increase in luminosity. Uh, the installation is almost complete. And something I should have stressed is that this full software trigger, just because you have much better information, you will have uh, uh, access to much better decisions. Your efficiency will be better. And, and certainly for hadronic modes, uh, uh, the efficiency could go up by a factor of two. So that is uh, so the increase in statistics comes not just from the luminosity, but from the trigger also. I should also remind you, and then I'm sure those of you on CMS know this very, very well, and I hope you'll forgive me for not mentioning it yet, but uh, uh, if you look to run four, uh, that's a very important time because that's when uh, the LHC itself will be uh, upgraded and we will switch essentially to a new accelerator, a high luminosity LHC. And coincident with that, there will be a uh, massive upgrades uh, installed for Atlas and CMS, so-called phase two upgrades. Uh, so the, these also uh, certainly demand comment. They, these will bring, uh, bring big capabilities across a whole swathe of physics, but also for flavor physics. The CMS tracker will be replaced and it will have a, a significantly improved momentum resolution. It will give this, this will give it better invariant mass uh, resolution. Uh, and uh, there's an intention to install a new track trigger at the earliest level, which would enable the experiment to, to trigger on hadronic decays. So, so CMS could even start to do uh, uh, precise uh, flavor physics studies in channels with, uh, which have hadronic final state. So this, this would be excellent. Uh, and I flash here some uh, uh, you know, projections in terms of uh, uh, JSI phi and uh, BS to mu mu for both Atlas and CMS, which these very, very large samples at the high lumi LHC uh, will make uh, possible. You can read about these in this recent uh, snow mass white paper. So Atlas and CMS will be very much contributing to this uh, voyage of discovery from the uh, late years of this decade. But let's look even beyond there. So now I'm looking to runs five and six. Uh, so this is in the uh, early years of the next decade. Uh, so we have plans already to in, install a new upgrade, upgrade two of LHCB. And that's just because by the end of a, uh, a run four, then our upgrade one will probably have done as good as it can do. We've collected over 15 verse centibarns. So to uh, make a further step in precision, we have to design something which can go still better and, and, and really exploit the full luminosity of the LHC, because even upgrade one will not be running at the full luminosity that we could, uh, uh, that could be delivered at uh, interaction point eight. So this upgrade two, uh, it's now in our advanced uh, conceptual stage. Uh, there are these three documents uh, and it's very much now part of the CERN baseline plan. And the most rightmost document, the so-called framework technical design report has recently uh, been approved. The goal here is to, is, is to run in the 10 to the 34 regime. So that's, that's essentially the top luminosity of the accelerator and integrate uh, over 250 inverse centibarns, maybe up to 300. This will pose enormous detector challenges. We, there's a big issues coming from radiation tolerance. We'll need higher granularity and we'll probably need very precise timing information. We want to know 
in certain subdetectors when each hit arrives to within a few tens of picoseconds. That's because we have high pileup up to 30 or 40 uh, interactions per crossing. And this information will enable us to mitigate the problem that that brings. Here's an obligatory uh, table just to show you the precision that uh, we, get, we have already in certain observables, what we will, should get it with our upgrade one and what would be achievable with upgrade two. I don't think it's useful to dwell on this here. Uh, suffice to say all the numbers are impressive, but this will be there in the slides for your perusal. So, but just more schematically, uh, visually, how will things look? Let's just consider the unitarity triangle. Um, so I'm showing you a, a, a picture just with LHCB inputs. Uh, so that's uh, unreasonable because the B factories pr provide very useful information, particularly on the, uh, particularly on this uh, in this green annulus here. But just to show you the impact of LHCB alone, but also lattice QCD, which is needed for the uh, green and orange annuli. So this was the status in 2018, not so different from now. This will be the status uh, uh, at the end of run three, the start of the high luminosity LHC. So a, a big, big improvement. I'm drawing this with everything lining up at the same point. Uh, uh, this is something we hope will not happen. And then if we get go forward to uh, 300 inverse center bonds, you see things uh, really sharpen up and we uh, reach a, a beautiful level of precision. And for charm physics, because we were speaking a lot uh, about that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Guy, to jump in there, but what, what, what are you assuming for the lattice here? Yes. Presumably it, the green band in particular is. Yes, it is. Um, it is. Uh, so so this, these were produced for uh, uh, this, uh, this document here, this physics case, uh, upgrade two. Uh, and this, uh, we, we uh, polled uh, myself and Vincenzo Bagnoni. We polled a, a community, uh, you know, a whole bunch of lattice uh, uh, QCD theorists, uh, and we asked how, how will things evolve because things have evolved a lot uh, over time, uh, and uh, we got a variety of responses, of course. Uh, but we, uh, uh, you know, averaged these and, and took a fairly conservative reading on them, uh, and I, I think there's a, a few more details in the document, but. Yeah, we didn't just pluck the numbers out of the air, but, but the, these numbers are external to LHCB for sure. Okay. 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 Uh, and just because we were talking about charm earlier, let me just emphasize you now this upgrade too, uh, just in terms of event yields, uh, what you would expect here would be just absolutely colossal yields. Uh, indeed, the issue of systematic uncertainties uh, cannot be ducked. Uh, I mean, how well can we analyze these samples? I mean, it's impossible to know, but people are ingenious uh, and we've managed it until now. But uh, if we manage to do this, uh, here is plotted, this is the CP violation in mixing. Uh, this is the Q over P against the phi plot, which we saw earlier, the blue band, that's the, the how things looked in 2017. Uh, as I've shown, it's actually improved significantly since then due to this uh, K short pi pi measurement. But in red is that that's where you could get to with this this additional amount of data. So it's a a, a real uh, you know, really something worth doing. Okay, I'm uh, almost done, but but I, I have two more slides, which is to so so what I've described will take us uh, into the uh, late twenty thirties. Uh, but what comes next? Well, you may know that there's a lot of discussion underway about. Uh, a new circular collider at CERN, the so-called future circular collider. So one sees that this is a plot taken, this is a photo taken from the Jura Mountains, looking down to the Geneva Plain. You can see the airport, uh, the lake, Mont Blanc behind. LHC is uh, this uh, black ring here. Uh, the FCC would be uh, almost 100 kilometers in, in circumference, and it would sweep around behind the Soleil. So the, a very ambitious project. It's currently undergoing a, a five-year feasibility study. Uh, one thing we have to acknowledge is that this uh, project would not uh, start uh, very soon. We're talking about beginning operation in the 2040s. Uh, it would house two consecutive accelerators. Firstly, you know, just as uh, the LHC tunnel did. LHC tunnel first housed the LEP E plus E minus collider. 
And so would this tunnel, it would house the so-called FCCEE. And this is a, a beautiful machine, very high luminosity, uh, that would operate at a range of collision energies, including the Z-pole. And one would get uh, 12 to the 10 to the 12 BB bar pairs there, uh, which is a big, big number. And you could do exceptional flavor physics with those. Now it uh, goes, obviously goes beyond the remit of my talk to speak about uh, future E plus and minus opportunities, but there will be a seminar on Friday by Stefan Monte. So I encourage you to listen to that. But then uh, beyond there, one would install this Hadron Collider, FCCHH. This would have a collision energy of something like 100 TV, a uh, luminosity of a few 10 to the 35. Uh, it would have, be, the ring would be equipped with two general purpose detectors in the spirit of Atlas and CMS, but just like the LHC already, it is foreseen that uh, one should have detect, dedicated interaction regions for other physics, including flavor. So one could envisage, and it's been talked about, a, a new generation uh, flavor physics experiment. I glibly call this FCCB. Uh, and this, how, why would this be better than uh, LHCB? Well, it would have a higher cross section because you're operating 100 TV. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we can imagine in, in the 30 or so years before this were to be built and would uh, begin operation, there are going to be big advances in technology and computing. And so this such an experiment would surely perform even better than uh, LHCB. Okay, so that is me done. Uh, conclude on our first part, uh, charm physics has had this renaissance and it's now a, very much a, a vibrant and frontier area for flavor studies. Uh, LHCB has played a leading role in this revival of super precise mixing measurements and the discovery of direct CP violation being highlights. And here I, I would assert uh, you know, that you know, for future advances in charm, we, we uh, the, the statistics available at, uh, at Upsilon 4S are just never going to be adequate. So only the LHC and only LHCB has the precision to refine these measurements and probe for the next breakthrough, for instance, CP violation in mixing related phenomena. Uh, despite these big increases in precision from the LHC, uh, there's a strong motivation to go still further. Uh, upgrade one will do this and it's about to take data. We're almost ready. Uh, it will be complemented after run uh, three by the phase two upgrades of Atlas and CMS. And then after that, a, a further step change coming from upgrade two of LHCB. And this will complete the full exploitation of the LHC as a flavor factory. And who knows where we will be. And looking still further forward, flavor studies at Hadron Colliders will reboot and enter a uh, still new era of precision with FCC HH. So thanks for your attention. And uh, I hope I've convinced some of you, uh, uh, please come individually or even better if you can uh, persuade Indian, Indian institutes as a whole, come and join LHCB. That is the future of flavor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank, thank you, Guy. I'm going to have to edit out the last bit of the talk, but that's uh... <laughs> an off message. Yeah. Um, so, uh, are there any uh, any questions for uh, for Guy? Guy, yeah, can I ask one some question? Yes. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, thanks a lot for this excellent set of lectures. I was just wondering, uh, you didn't say anything or probably you never planned to uh, say unless I missed it about uh, like sign dileptron asymmetry that Tevatron had measured. Yes. So, so yeah. uh, what are the prospects for LXCB? Can LXCB do it? Uh, yes, I, I don't have any slides prepared. Uh, I. I um... Indeed, uh, just to help the others, and, and you clearly know well that there was a, uh, a, a measurement which was performed by the D0 uh, experiment uh, uh, quite a few years ago now, which was uh, showed a surprisingly large uh, signal for what is expected to be uh, something very, very small in the standard model. Uh, now, LHCB has uh, actually already contributed to this, so we've made a measurement of, of, of the uh, semi-leptonic asymmetries in uh, both the BS and the BD systems. 
uh, these asymmetries probe uh, uh, CP violation in mixing. Uh, the precision we had was uh, certainly uh, uh, very comparable to, to, to that of the D0 measurement, uh, D0 certain advantages here. Uh, and it was not, and our measurements were, were, were compatible with the standard model. But, but we, we are seeking to improve these measurements. Uh, uh, there is an analysis close to approval, which will uh, uh, give us a further step forward in precision. And it's certainly uh, foreseen that in these future experiments, upgrade one and upgrade two, we will continue to do this. Uh, we, we, we hope that we will have the precision to see, for example, uh, the, uh, this asymmetry, at least in the BS system. I mean, I don't want to be provocative, but, but I think you know the interest in the D0 measurement has somewhat waned, partly because of our measurements and partly because you know it's that's just one of those things. Uh, it's, there's nothing has come to back it up, but it's important to measure these parameters still more precisely. Thanks. Thanks. I, I just had one question before you go, because I, I, I guess I could look this up, but the, for FCC HH, you mentioned 2040s for EE, but what, it's, so what is the plan once EE is operational and you move to HH, or is that too early to yeah. tell? This is, uh, yeah, something which, uh, yeah, the proponents of the scheme try to not be too loud about because the time scales are not uh, encouraging. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the, the problem is, I mean, we can't build FCC HH yet because we don't have the magnet technology. We need to devise that. Uh, so an FCC EE would uh, make a huge amount of sense. This comes first. Uh, at the moment, uh, this means this starting you know, in, in around uh, 2040, uh, you'd run that for 10 years, maybe a bit more. So, so you're, you're uh, uh, put it this way, Jim. We, we, we won't be uh, we won't be uh, running a, a lecture school uh, at that time. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very important project, but the time scale is a little frightening, uh, and in, indeed, people involved in it are looking at ways that this could be accelerated somehow. Okay. All right. So thank you very much, Guy. Um...